Yeah, I'm going to report it now. Session. Now we've got we're calling our uh, traditional clinical courses. Uh, first off, we're going to have our representatives from Columbia Law School. Then we'll hear from CUNY, University of Miami, and then Georgetown. And then we'll open it up for discussion again. Um, so I guess we'll start off with Columbia and Conrad Johnson. Thank you. Uh, where's my clicker? Um, thank you, Andrew. So, uh, first of all, it's, can't tell you how refreshing it is, Ron, to be described as a traditional clinic. Uh, <laughs> after years of not, but we are, in fact, a traditional clinic. Um, it's also going to be interesting to get three law professors to, to talk in two-minute segments. Uh, it's kind of trying to fit an elephant in the shoebox. You only have a half a minute left. That's all right. Don't worry. I'm not going to use it up on this show. Uh, <laughs> So uh, we thought what we do is we frame what we do in the clinic generally, and then Brian will tell us sort of where A to J fits into that, and then Mary will talk to you a little bit about an example that uh, where we used A to J to, to, to a good effect, we think, and what reactions we got from that. So um, the clinic generally, uh, 18 years ago, right around this time, there, I got a memo, and all the faculty at Columbia got a memo saying there would be some folks from LexisNexis who are going to show us how to create electronic course materials, right? And I thought, oh, this is going to be a big meeting. I better get there early. And they put it in a room. They could call it, house the entire faculty. You know, and I bust through the door and they go, oh, you got a seat, good seat, you know? And there are nine people, you know, like a few folks from Columbia, like, like Brian, who was at the time masquerading as a recent reference librarian, but was working on the Thinking Machines project. Um, and like six guys from Lexus, it was <coughs> unbelievable. The entire audience consisted of me, unbeknownst to me, my partner in crime, Mary Zulak, and showed up, and Peter Strauss, who was a former Catholic board member. That was the entire, so the, the presenters outnumbered the audience three to one. Um, and so they were talking to us about this thing called Folio Views. It was gonna be, it was basically a database that contained content, that was going to allow students to freely get their materials and search and annotate and make links and comments and blah, blah, blah. It's going to be the greatest thing in the world, which for us was fantastic because we were running a traditional civil rights litigation clinic. And every May, we would look at our materials and we'd say, well, we'll take out one case and we'll add another 100, uh, 100 pages. And so it went from one volume to two volumes to three volumes. And the idea of getting them all on a disk at that time um, and having folks be able to have it for free seemed like a great idea. And when it was all done, you know, the folks at Lexus said to us, you know, you now are in the top one-tenth of one percent of law professors who know about technology. And I said, well, that's my sweet spot. You know, we're in Columbia. That's where we went. <laughs> Just seeing if you're with uh, 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 At least you're offended. Um, so, <laughs> going for the high points. Uh, so I, I walk home, and I, go, I get inside my house, get barely my big fat head through the door, and uh, my wife, who works as an office manager, and I uh, in by New York standards as a small boutique firm, 25 lawyers, Park Avenue, <clears throat> high profile, white collar criminal cases. She's not a lawyer. Um, she says to me, so how was your day? Well, me in the top one. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> uh, legal educators who know about technology. Uh, well, really, what, tell me about what about this thing. It's a database, you know, it can search, it can slice an apple, it can do this, it can do that. She says, hmm, that sounds like folio views. I said, what? <laughs> and she said, yeah, we've been using that for years to do deposition digest. And it was at that moment that me at the top 10th of 1% realized that we were not educating our students for the practice environment in which they would be entering upon graduation. And so <clears throat> we started using the technology and we found that it gave us a great edge in supervision, training, and uh, actual litigation of cases. Uh, and after a few more years, even though we were heavily invested in civil rights practice, we decided to change the focus of our clinic so that we could teach students how to use technology um, out in the world. And we would partner with public interest organizations and the court systems whom we believe would not have the resources, the time, and the energy to experiment with this stuff on their own. And so we created the Lawyering in the Digital Age Clinic uh, our goals are simple. We, um, we're going to study the impact of technology on law practice and the profession. Uh, we're going to talk to students about teach them lawyering skills. Uh, we're going to work with real lawyers and judges on real cases. And basically, we thought of this as basic lawyering. 
And so we began, this, we're starting our 14th year now. Um, we uh, begun with a basic paradigm that says law runs on information. And essentially lawyers do three things. They gather, they manage, yes they do, <laughs> and they present information. Uh, and we organize our syllabus accordingly. And as Brian will tell you, uh, Brian will tell you where the A to J piece of this sort of fits in. Um, but not yet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but soon. But soon. But soon. Um, so, um, we teach, of course, traditional skills, um, which will be coming up shortly. Uh, so in the gathering unit, we talk about interviewing and managing, we talk about counseling and presenting, we talk about drafting. Uh, but we also teach contemporary skills in each of those units. So you'll see that in addition to teaching interviewing, we teach contemporary skills, learning how to do e-discovery, electronic fact gathering, searching, that kind of stuff, and so forth and so on. Um, our casework uh, involves multidisciplinary work. So we're not just focused on one area of the law. So. Uh, you can get experience in public interest work, or private sector work if you're a student, <coughs> litigation or transactional work, opportunities, and our goal is to create systemic change and access to justice. And Mary's going to talk more about that. And Mary's going to talk more about that, and Brian's going to talk to you about where this fits in. Very good. It's not that. It's not that. It's not that. No, thank you. All right. I am going to, I would be the first person I've ever seen trying to do something like this. So gathering, managing, presenting. Where, 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 where does HJ author fit in here? That's an M. <laughs> well, the light is being heckled. <laughs> it's awesome. okay. So, so you know what's interesting is that when we started out, oh, so many years ago, there weren't anything that you could point to like this that contained lawyering in the digital age. So basically, we had to make it up. I mean, this is this is sort of how we made it up. This time around. Uh, as outlined in gathering, managing, presenting, we think A to J author fits into the managing part of this, right? We're talking about managing knowledge, right? <coughs> managing knowledge. And um, in each of these three sections, gathering, managing, presenting, we break them down into theory, techniques, and tools. And so we, we try to think about knowledge management theory. Once again, there isn't a heck of a lot written about knowledge management theory, but we thought we might look at it in terms of knowledge management theory that consists of cycles and levels, right? We think of cycles. We think of the, the, the basic cycle of knowledge management that's pretty well understood, that you're trying to make the implicit explicit. And then when we talk about that, that I think relates directly to, um, you know, a, a concept that's that's been used in clinical you know practice for quite a while now called reflection and action. So that's that's something that I think I, I hopefully clinicians can connect to, right? The idea of reflection and action that relates directly to the idea of knowledge management. Um, and then within cycle uh, within levels, um, we, we, we divide that into the individual cohort and community level. These are three levels that we think are useful. And that when we think about these levels, that you know, the HJ author and the HJ project really fits in this community level, right? The community of people who are in the legal aid and legal services uh, offices, as well as the broader community that they're trying to help. And so, so that's sort of our, our, our theory part of this. And then technique, I, I'll just summarize as something which Professor Johnson came up with a long time ago, which is that we tell our students each semester to start digital and stay digital. All right, and I'll just sort of leave it at that as good advice. And then tools. So in each of these, you know, we talk about theory, techniques, and tools within gathering, managing, and presenting, and that this is obviously a tool, right? The idea that one could learn how to use this software in order to accomplish a goal, you know, for, for the greater good, uh, is like you know, using many other tools that we, we try to get our students to use. Um, we're talking about case map or time map, or, and we're talking about Clio before or Amicus. You know, these these are tools that um, your lawyers need to know, and students should learn in law school. And so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Oh, there you go.
One one thing that when we change from doing housing discrimination civil rights, um, we said, okay, what is our topic? It's lawyering in the digital age, but we became sort of a clinic without boundaries. Most clinics have a topic, elder law or something like that. And these are examples of the kinds of substantive work that students are doing recently. Um, we realized that knowledge management is a key part of lawyering, and we have to do that also as professors. We are not experts in all of this. We teach as a team of three. We have the students work in teams of two or sometimes four. Uh, and we have partners in the, the environment who want things that our students can create. Um, this one, the car confiscation website, is, is one that was particularly neat because no practitioner will do those cases. It's not civil, it's not criminal of any importance. But if you had your car confiscated, it's kind of important to you. And so we created a website, and recently, in one of the written opinions by the administrative law judge, the petitioner had gone to our website, realized that he should have gotten notice of his right for the hearing, printed it out from the web, sent it in, got his hearing, won his hearing because he used the website, and that's in the written opinion. Oh, this guy prevailed. Well, that's kind of nice to mm -hmm. actually know what pro se people are doing. Yeah, law and judge sort of in. Now, finding the need for technology to be used, finding a process to use it, getting results. I want to give one illustration, and this is from Judge Fern Fisher, who is here, who came to a Cali conference. Brian remembers it well, and Ron remembers it well and said, look, I need something. What, what can you provide? And she became converted to the A to J world. Uh, before that, we had been working with her and we kept working with her to develop an answer for tenants to use in housing court. In New York, there is no standard form that landlords use to start an eviction. So it couldn't be, you know, look at line one, is that your landlord, yes or no? Look at line two, is that your amount of rent? yes or no, because they draft it as they see fit. So she was trying to develop a form for unrepresented tenants. There are about 300,000 of them a year in the New York courts. Uh, can't get a lawyer no matter what. What the judges are dealing with when they have a tenant who doesn't know her rights to any extent is really very, very difficult. And Judge Fisher had practiced as a tenant attorney and knew that through a real interview, you would discover defenses and counterclaims. So this is her, her assistant Michelle, student Lorenzi, student Allison, me and Brian in earlier days. Uh, and Judge Fisher would come to our office every Wednesday at 11 o'clock and work it through. That's kind of what minute thought. What, this was before the days of smart words. And so the students would project what they had done on a whiteboard and then stand up and put in the comments on that. So we really worked shoulder to shoulder to get it done. Um, it is now, um, this is in the Court of Appeals, our highest court, and for three years running, there would be something our clinic had done which was in the state of the judiciary address at the Court of Appeals. This year it was this, this answer project. So it really has made an impact. The court system itself is using these forms to get a high profile publicity about them. And they keep proliferating because it really it really works. So it's just one of the kind of things we, we have done with experts guiding it to fruition. And the experts that have been pointed out are the judge but also the clients who have to try to use it. And I walked through the halls of Brooklyn Housing Court the other day, and ridiculous little cubbies out in the hallways where people are sitting with pro clients, powering through the A2J, a mile a minute, and it spits out a very strange little form, but pages and pages of advice, customized legal advice. That practicing law, well, it's the court system that's doing it. And yeah, we've been honored to be able to work on that. That's it.
I want to thank John, Ron, and Andrew for having me here. It's great to be here. My first Cali conference. Uh, this is who I am, and just want to note that in addition, I've taught a first-year lawyering seminar at CUNY as a hybrid course, where one-third of the classes were, were online, and it was essentially a, a semester-long simulation where students wrote a memo and did an oral argument. I've also taught a, uh, a bar elective in wills, trusts, and estates with a um, practical component in which students actually drafted wills for other people and had, a, had an interview as part of the course. Uh, this is um, CUNY School of Law, who, which responded to the legal crisis 30 years ago and, uh, and developed as a, as a public interest law school designed to prepare students to practice with, with, with social justice permeating the entire curriculum, as well as experiential learning. Uh, you know, we had some negotiations here, and I just want everybody to realize that we, we did the New York schools in reverse chronological order, in terms of... <laughs> Nobody gets that. Are you talking trash? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. Uh, now this this no no go back go back. So this building uh, is our new building. We moved into it uh, a year ago in uh, Long Island City in Queens. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, it's just east of Manhattan, and uh, and essentially being a part of Manhattan. What I'm not showing you in this in this. In this uh, in this slide uh, are our previous two buildings. The most recent one was a converted junior high school in Flushing, right across the street from the cemetery, accessible only by car, subway, and then a bus. And our original building was a converted grammar school in Bayside, Queens, where if you wanted to get a drink of water, you had to... <laughs> I, I co-teach the Elder Law Clinic. Uh, to my left is my co-teacher, Daniel Levister, and these are uh, two students, Marita Robinson and uh, Monette Evans. Uh, and we are, if you see over my shoulder on this side, those pillars of the um, Supreme Court of Bronx County, where, um, and, and in New York, adult guardianships under Article 81 of the Mental Hygiene Law are heard in the Supreme Court, the, the trial court in New York. If you look over uh, Monette's head, on that side of the screen, you see Yankee Stadium. And uh, so we are... Screw the Bruins. So it, the, the Elder Law Clinic does a variety of cases. Um, our, our kind of our main, uh, the main cases in our docket uh, are adult guardianships. And, um, and, and these, are, these are cases uh, in which we are appointed by the court to represent the person who's alleged to be incapacitated, or we're appointed by the court to be the court evaluator, which is the guardian ad litem uh, equivalent. Uh, and we also represent petitioners who are seeking to become a guardian for somebody else. Uh, and, and so the great thing about, uh, and, and we also do some transactional work. We do, we have a project with a, with a social service agency where we, we visit homebound clients and we draft wills, advance directives. We do a variety of, of other matters, but we use the guardianships as kind of the, the focal point of our, of our teaching. Um, and, and so, um, you know, with our court-appointed work in these guardianship cases, uh, there's a hearing in every case. So students get an opportunity, and, and the hearing happens within 30 days. So in, in, in this one semester clinic, uh, which is worth 12 credits, we also have an advanced clinic option for a small number of students with, with fewer credits. But in the, in the fall semester, um, most every student has a chance to, to be in court, 
um, a number of times and, and playing a variety of roles. So uh, there's a, a nice mix of litigation and non-litigation. A few years ago, uh, we, we realized that we were getting a lot of calls from people who wanted to be guardian for somebody, but we could only represent a handful of them. So, um, so, no, no, go back, go back. So, <laughs> so we'll, we, we'll make the eye contact. <laughs> this is actually the, um, the historic Long Island City Courthouse, which is right across the street from, from the law school. And it's had some famous trials and including the trial of uh, Willie Sutton, the banker, when he was asked, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. <laughs> so um, this is not where the guardianship cases are, are, are heard, but, um, but we realized there was a problem with access to guardianship court. The courts were not accepting people um, doing it on their own. So uh, we decided to create this Pro Se Guardianship Project. And a couple of years ago, students worked really diligently and created um, extensive forms, questions and answers, instructions, but all paper-based. And it's on our website, um, and it's in PDF form. And, uh, and so these just give you a sense of, of, some, of the, some of the clients and, and some of the people uh, who we see, who we see in court, who are subject to, to, um, to, the, to the guardianship system. Um, come back, come back. So, um, you know, over the past couple of years, we've, we've really started to use these pro se forms and information with people coming into our office and um, working through them and, and actually sending them off to court and, um, and them being successful in filing the papers. And one of the great things about guardianships under Article 81 is, as I mentioned, in every case, the court has to appoint a court evaluator. So in, in uncontested matters or matters that are a little contested, if you get into the courthouse, there's, there's a, a, a fairly level playing field. You know you'll have a court evaluator who serves as the eyes and ears of the court to advise the judge and, and write a written report and actually testify as to what should happen. Make recommendations, should there be a guardian appointed? If so, what kind of power? So I think it's particularly well suited for helping people get in the court. There's some protection uh, in case, you know, in case it becomes more contested than we, than we might assess. This past um, semester, we saw um, more pro se clients than we had before. And one of my students who really took the lead in, in this phase of the project and, um, and, and just did a terrific job, then I told her, hey, great news. I'm going to be part of this access to justice clinical project. And I told her about it, and this is what, what she said. And uh, she said, you know, you, you guys taught us, you know, the complexity of interviewing, the importance of connecting with clients, assessing, you know, the unsaid as well as the said. You know, what, what, and now you're telling me that you're going to convert all this to uh, a computer? So, um, you know, it really struck a chord with me, and, um, and, and you know, I, I, I take it to heart, and I think it's a, it's a major challenge, and I mean, we've kind of been joking around, can you program empathy? And, uh... Yes. <laughs> okay, so, so um, in thinking about uh, this project and how A2J is going to fit into it. Um, I think it, it fits in perfectly, and it's really my initial reaction is this is exactly what we need because um, you know we're we're just dealing with with uh, static paper, and you know we really need this next level, the interactive dimension, and all of that. But I think the challenge for for clinicians and for me uh, is to figure out had it really integrated into what we try and teach students. 
these different levels, theory, doctrine, practice, and really the warring skills, um, helping them develop mastery, prepare to practice. And so, you know, thinking backwards, um, obviously the ultimate goal is to help the students really, you know, understand in all its complexity um, what these guardianship laws mean and what it means uh, in terms of the law and the, and the people it serves and the overall system as well as the, you know, the full range of the lawyering skills um, and help to prepare them to practice. And I'm, I'm guessing that the A2J um, guided interview will be the evidence that they're, that they're getting that. And, uh, and then what I've got to do starting when I get home is to figure out how I'm going to devise the curriculum that will make this, um, you know, realize the, the potential it has. Thank you. guardianships and wills, housing and employment. Many of these areas are really uniquely suited for A to J guided interviews, and we're looking forward to developing the software that will, that will work uh, for those practice areas. This is an interprofessional healthcare delivery uh, system, and you can see it in action here. We actually have an on-site lawyer, law student, a physician, a psychiatrist, a forensic psychiatric fellow, medical residents, and our collaboration really does help underserved veterans access justice. Um, it also does a great educational piece, which is helping both law students and medical residents and medical students form professional identities as part of an interdisciplinary team. Um, it is a true partnership. Here you see a doctor, a medical resident, a social worker, an attorney, and a law student all gathering together to look at a veteran's medical records to advocate for his legal case. By the way, the VAMC has a lot of drawbacks, but one thing it doesn't have is its medical records are all fully automated, which is very interesting for us. Um, as our law practice still is not fully automated at all. <laughs> I want to tell you a little bit in the time I've got left uh, about the demographics of the Miami area of the AMC, its population, its, um, and its needs. Uh, as John mentioned earlier today, there is literally no way anyone could help all the people who need help. Just within this little, so we're going to show you who we're serving, and even within that, which is why we were so excited about the A to J, there are 58,000 veterans in the Miami VAMC catchment area. And as you can see, 74% of those are uh, classified by the VAMC or by the VA as at or, at or below the means threshold. And so that's 43,000 just in this one Miami catchment area. Um, of those, 5.11% report, self-report as being homeless. We think the homeless numbers, so that's roughly 3,000. We think that the homeless uh, numbers are much higher than that um, because 
probably doesn't count people who are doubled up with friends and family. They don't tend to self-report as homeless. Um, and so vets tend to over-report their access to housing rather than under-support. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to my partner in the endeavor, um, Melissa Swain, whose birthday it is today. She's chosen wow. to do it. And with that, we'll start with mental health. So, um, in terms of mental health at the VA, self-reported is a little bit over 38%. Um, it's clear to us, interviewing and working with this population, that it's underreported. And the last thing you ever want to do is send a veteran to a court system with, where they are going to get front desk. Right? And so, meaning that they try to access the court system and they say, no, you need to go over there, you need to go over here, you have the wrong form, et cetera. Veterans are the last population you want to do that to. And so, our goal is to have the A2J computer software in the place where they are at least the most comfortable, which is the VA hospital. That's where the lawyers go to meet with them. We do not ask them to come to Coral Gables, to the law school. We have a law office at the hospital, and our goal is to have the computers with the software at the hospital as well. Um, you can also see that we have a big population of 65 plus, and so there's a lot of different needs that they have. We've heard a lot today about elder law, permanency planning, advanced directives, and this is particularly suited again to the access to justice and A to J guided interviews. Um, in terms of wars, these are the breakdowns for the different wars. And you can see um, that we've really got big populations of Vietnam vets, um, and people are still trying to access, and you may have seen it in the news, these VA benefits that are so, so backlogged, and there aren't enough attorneys that are working on this. And so that's another area that we're thinking about in terms of how can we get the VA benefits, um, you know, more access to justice. Um, in terms of self-reported unmet legal needs, um, people for, that are below the means threshold, 14,000 reported that um, they had unmet legal needs. And what we found out is as soon as we start interviewing them, they might come and say, I need a driver's license. That's sort of their initial reason of why they showed up to us. But then once we do the legal assessment, you know, it's 17 different things um, that they need help with. And so we're trying to figure out how do we incorporate that legal assessment um, on an HJ guided interview. Um, in terms of types of cases, We've really had a big percentage of permanency planning, advanced directives, wills, um, guardianship, pre-guardianships. And so we're looking to see, is that the best place to start this pilot? Is that what people feel more comfortable or most comfortable with? Um, in terms of the next slide, this is what we've seen doctors do feel more comfortable with. They do understand that their patients need a will or their patients need a pre-need guardianship. And we've had doctors actually write out a prescription for a will, and so we're trying to see if this would actually be a place where the A2J could really have buy-in from the veterans, have buy-in from the VA, and have buy-in from the doctors. It seems that, especially in the VA, they are comfortable with this idea of writing a prescription for a will. So maybe we can get them to write a prescription for a guided interview and write a prescription for an A2J author. Um, and so we, what we're trying to figure out is how, let's talk to the actual veterans about how this is gonna work. And so as I said before, one goal is to get this software inside of the hospital. The other goal is there's not enough attorneys. There's not even enough law students, but there are enough veterans, right? And so we are working on a time banking, pay it forward model which once one veteran goes through the A to J author guided interview and gets a pre need guardianship form printed out and figures out the correct court to go to, that then he or she can teach the next veteran. And so that may actually really help with the gap to justice. So with the lawyers and the law students figuring out the guided interviews and then getting it to the veterans who then through a peer-to-peer -peer volunteer network if we can pilot this and it'll work in Miami, you can put this in every VA across the country. And so that's sort of um, the overarching long-term goal. 
So the solution, there's your, there's your picture that we were able to steal. Um, and the, in terms of the class and how we think we're going to retool, we've already decided we're kicking it to the spring um, because now we realize what we're getting ourselves into. And in 14 weeks, this is sort of the plan of what we want to do. Um, and especially within November, which will now be kicked to the spring, we want to have the clients, the actual veterans, practice on the A to J software and see if they like it. If they hate it, we will change it. The students will have to change it. You don't get a final grade unless it's veteran approved. Um, and so that's how that's going to work. That's it. So we actually have a delay for our next presentation, so I want to try to take some questions now while we can, and then we can come back and hear more from Georgetown in a few minutes. So does anybody have any questions for any of the presenters that we've had so far, or comments, thoughts? Mary? I, I have one comment, and that is the, um, the need to get everything finished in one semester. Uh, we have worked with things that lasted uh, years, and it is fine. You get a quality product. The students are proud of what they've done in their semester, and so I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel disappointed if this <laughs> doesn't all happen in one semester. Good. Anybody else? Back. And my question is for anyone in the Columbia team, and that is, um, a new project in which you're working on a, a website or something else that needs upkeep in the future. How do you? Um, get that done. Uh, we've worked with the court and setting up a website, but then the big question is, okay, well, who's going to take it from here? Who's going to keep it updated? How do you deal with that? When we go into the projects, we see ourselves more as an incubator than you know, trying to manage it long term. And in most instances, and we've done quite a few of these, uh, that they do get handed off at some point. Um, there's, there's one site that uh, manages uh, regulations uh, for the Department of uh, Health and, and whatnot that's under uh, the control of uh, some of the people who work with uh, who are administrative law judges that I'm still working with, but that's a rare exception. I mean, we, we, we do figure out ways, and, and each one has a sort of its own history. But um, but, but in, as you go into it, <laughs> we're thinking about well, how how can we how can we possibly get this turned over at some point? Which is one of the reasons why we only use the technology that the client or organization has already available to them. Only once in 13 years have we ever had somebody buy something, uh, but it was only because they wanted to expand the license they already had. But you know, so we're not imposing anything on them that they later sit there with. Well, I'm going to pay these bills and all that. Um, I wondered if there's a way, uh, for example, with the elder law work uh, being done, I know, Andrew, you sent me the uh, prior student's work that was an advanced directive for North Carolina. Our statute uh, is built on the uniform statute for advanced directives, and I wonder whether for some of the things that are already established, whether a broader community could have access to them because they might be able to implement that more readily. Um, does that make sense? No, it definitely makes sense, and that's one of the values that I think we see in the new A to J Author 5.0. As everything goes up online, and everything is done through one central portal, rather than installed on individual computers and operated from individual computers, schools from around the country can sort of pick up where one school left off, research the law in their area, and then adapt that guided interview for their purposes. So they may only have to change three questions instead of writing an interview that has 20, 30, 40 questions. And, and those might be, um, we were talking about semester, only semester-long projects. Those might be interesting semester-long projects. Take an A to J interview from one state and then adopt it for your state. You know, it's short, it's, it's constrained, most of the work has been done, you know, perfect semester-long project. Uh, for the uh, folks working on the veterans, uh, are you familiar with the Wills Project in Utah? Okay. <laughs> what about the rest of us? <laughs> so, so for the rest of, for the rest of you, it, um, that was Larry Farmer from Brigham University, who is like a pioneer in this field. He developed software and has been teaching back in assembly for 30 years. 
84. 84. Uh, and uh, he's going to tell you a little bit about the Navy Well, actually, a colleague of uh, mine, Marshall Maurice, uh, developed this uh, build project. So they have the software already developed. That, uh, and if you know about that, uh, they've been delivering wills free for veterans uh, in the state of Utah for three or four years, I think. And I'm sure they. What's the name of the software? They would. What's that? What's the name of the software? Uh, Wills for Heroes or something like that. Pardon? Using hat decks. Uses uses hot jobs and it works with A to J. It would work with A to J as an underlying platform. Just got to put it all together. Anybody have other questions, thoughts? What, my, one of my questions is, is around um, uh, reaching out to practitioners as well as directly to clients. Um, uh, in Vermont, we have not um, had a, a, a law school-based project on this, but one of my students uh, was hired directly by the court system to automate uh, most of the family law uh, procedures uh, using AJ, and, and it's, it's been a, a, a success. It's been such a success that I'm hearing back from the practitioner community that they love it because it means that they can actually sit down with a, with a client and do a, 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 a divorce for considerably less by, by, by using this as, as, a, as a facility. Now, actually, the Vermont courts say you're not supposed to do that. Nobody seems to pay attention. But, but, but it strikes me that, that we have, you know, particularly in the clinical model, have focused on the fact that we are with, with dealing directly with the client. But I think that it would be worthwhile taking on board that there is this intermediate world as well where, where, where we will be assisting practitioners uh, uh, to, to provide guidance so that you know, it's not an either or, uh, but, 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 but extending the reach of justice by, by making it, it much more affordable for a lawyer to set. So anyway, I would, I'd be interested in hearing people's thoughts about that and whether, whether the, the county project made a could, could be adapted more into, into to making that a possibility as well. The, the entire focus of our clinic, most of our clients are either court systems or the focus of our clinic, our clients are mostly either court systems or legal aid and services providers um, who we work with and our students work with them with you know, actual clients on a smaller level so they get a better sense of what the problem looks like so that when they do some technological solution, they understand it from the ground up. But our thought is we're doing, as Brian said, incubator work and we're working with organizations that can then who are interested sincerely in changing the way they do their practice so that they in turn multiply that effect for the many clients that they see. But in legal, you know, in New York, for example, legal aid turns away eight out of every nine people who come to their door, physically come to their door, much less the people who need the services. And so that's where we see our work. Occasionally we'll do a work for an individual, but mostly we're interested in system reform. Yeah, so, so I, why don't you ask Will and, and Richard to talk about making that jump, you know, that, that um, Oliver described. Because it's, it's more than legal aid that we're talking about here, right? Yeah, just, a, just a quick anecdote. Um, uh, a graduate of CUNY who is uh, working for a, a, one of the few graduates of CUNY who work for a large firm in New York, uh, he told me that his pro bono work was uh, was adult guardianships, and he was floundering around his first case and uh, couldn't really find materials to help him. And he stumbled upon our um, our do-it-yourself materials, and he said that that he he really used them and you know really learned the area of law and and has done a number of, of cases with that. So I think that that that's good evidence. Of what you're saying. And, and that's a segue to to Richard. I mean, there have been at least a couple of technology innovation TIG grants from the Legal Services Corporation that are aimed at sort of helping uh, uh, tap into the pro bono market. Think about the foreclosure crisis. That one was a Georgia project that was prepare A to J and back end hot docs tools for volunteer lawyers who don't know anything about real estate, don't know anything about mortgage foreclosure who can then volunteer and do this work in the context that you described. And there's no reason you can't make that jump, right? The jump to like uh, all these folks that are trying to serve the late market that Richard cares about. Uh, let me think about a couple of things. First of all, um, <coughs> embedding them on a direct law solution 
we've actually automated wills, powers of attorney, living wills, durable powers of attorneys for every state in the country, which lawyers use in an unbundled model when they give legal advice together with the forms. We also make that it's not compatible yet with A to J because we're using another document automation solution, but we make it available for free. And these are well-tested documents that we actually distribute them through major insurance companies, which get them out, and that's what's going on, which get them out for free policy holders and other things like that. So you can go to direct lawyers and actually see it rather than reinvent the wheel. I mean, the wheels are complicated to do. They're not simple to do. I can't tell you how much development time we have in wheels, and there's a lot of variation of living wheels state by state. That's the one. Some, number two, we kind of try and now reach out uh, to try and uh, develop the kind of educational component that I was talking about uh, to educate lawyers <coughs> and make that connection. But the major connection for us ends up being state bar associations. That's the channel. Is that what you were asking about before? About, you know, in other words, basically connecting with lawyers to make this technology available for that place. Yes, I mean, we, we tend to think in silos of, 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 right. of uh, a clinic, uh, legal aid, pro bono, right. uh, no bono, you know, I mean, and... and I, I, Wall Street. And Wall Street, yeah, and, and I think there's actually much more of a continuum here, uh, and, and it would be worth, worth our, our while, you know, the, the, to have maybe a, a practitioner button on, on A to J as well, so that, that, that you, you could design it, so that, that someone who's a practitioner come in and, and, and make use, and then hopefully deliver guided legal services at a lower price in, in the way we, we think is, is a good idea. Yeah, I agree with that. Do you want to say else? Yeah, actually, the uh, ABA Board of Governors is meeting today, um, and I'm anticipating they're going to fund a project proposal that I made. Uh, Tell them who you are. Uh, I'm Will Hornsby. I'm uh, staff counsel at the American Bar Association, and uh, work for uh, the Standing Committee on Delivery of Legal Services, which is dedicated to moderate income delivery and private sector solutions. Um, so, uh, you know, if you think of the legal profession and stratifications, you've got the Pinnacle uh, uh, Amlock 200 firms of providing corporate legal services, you've got legal aid, um, and in that vast middle, we've got the uh, private sector uh, fundamentally uh, personal legal service providers, which is about two thirds of all practitioners. So, it's a huge uh, uh, marketplace uh, for these services, and we're working for trying to get. Uh, uh, automation uh, integrated into that marketplace, but it's very difficult because it's not particularly uh, a, a willing market. They don't um, they, you know, uh, jump out of their seats to uh, to go for these when they're offered in the marketplace um, through things like uh, you know, Richard Services. And uh, uh, but it's becoming more and more important to create efficiencies that reduce costs, and, and I think we're going to see more of that. And I think the incubators um, are going to be um, advocates of that as well. So what's the Board of Governors doing today? Well, I, I have a, a proposal uh, for a project to be funded uh, next fiscal year that, that will um, look at ways in which we can implement methodologies um, into the uh, private sector that will make uh, services more affordable. Great. I don't know what you said. Yeah, that's, that's good because... Actually, I kind of wanted to come back and write you down to hear from Georgetown a little bit and hear what their course is doing. Yeah, what I'd like to do here is um, I, I've been stalling a little um, um, <laughs> trading messages with my co-presenter, Tanina Orozco, who's on her way over, uh, and she'll probably go after the break. But I wanted to talk a little bit briefly about some of the things that we did in our course that I think are really good things to think about as people are going into like thinking about if you're adopting this, whether it's part of a clinic or part of something else, is some of the experiences that our students had that I think are very meaningful, and I'll try to keep it in three minutes or less so we still have time for, for questions, and then I'll cede the rest of my time to my co-presenter. So some of the things that we did with our course, uh, and I wrote a little paper on this, and there's a AAAL ILTA white paper, and within that there's um, a description of, of some of the, the ideas that we have, but what we have our students do is that we have them build uh, projects working together with um, service providers. These are these are NGOs. They're uh, legal service providers, things like that. Trying to partner with them to build tools and solutions for particular unique problems. Um, very briefly, the, the main points that I'd like to say that I think our students are really good at doing, and we're trying to emphasize in terms of the value of learning about these things and integrating things like A to J author and other learning tools into the environment are the first and main thing that you people need to do is 
understand sort of the fundamental problem that's out there and be able to document that in a way that you can kind of put it like pen to paper. Like the first thing that we do is we get people to say, what is the problem at hand and what are the outputs? What are, what are the components to the ways that you can automate, whether it's the advice, whether it's filling out the form, things like that. So the first thing is still, you know, architecting the solution. There's some, some parts on that in the paper that we've written. And then with that, then, then taking those tools, then you can apply it within the, the platform that you have going. Um, but then a couple of things that we really try to emphasize that's going on in, in some of the other courses here as well is, is coursework, is teamwork. So people have to work together. People have to build something together. The initial one that we did is they built things together sort of conceptually. And then the next thing that we did moving to this access to justice area is that we had people then working together in teams to then work with the provider to say, what do you need? What is it that your organization needs that's going to help serve the most number of people, help us answer the most number of questions? You know, one example would be, everybody's asking the court system in California about record expungement. Well, let's figure out what does it take, what are the components to doing record expungement, and what are the um, aspects of that that we need to do to create the solution to solve that. But then the big thing that we try to do with our students is then force them to understand that to be able to present it. At the end of the class, we have a competition that we call Iron Tech Lawyer, where people get up in front of a panel of judges. And it's a little bit like a, a funding startup or things like that, where we force people to, in the preparation for doing it, do an Ignite-style presentation to learn presentation skills, to learn how to focus, to learn how to um, effectively demonstrate and deliver a message in a very short period of time. And then at the competition, what they have to do is they have to say, here's the problem, here's the solution, here's why it happens. And then the panel of judges come back to them and grill them to say, yes, but, you know, have you thought about X, have you thought about Y, how is it going to get implemented in practice? Um, one of, I think, um, and we, we polled the students after that saying, well, did you like the competition or not? And every single one of them, with one exception, said, without the competition, they wouldn't have cared as much and they wouldn't have put as much effort into it. So there's a big component to that where we say, you have to be able to present these ideas and you have to understand how these systems are solving legal practice problems whether it's, in, in we focus on the HJ and, and access to justice field, but then we also want to make it available so that people can do, you know, deliver a message to, you know, critical um, audience, critical clients in a, in a realm that's um, relevant to any practice area. So I think that that's a big component to what we try to do is be able to distill it, document it in a, in a very um, systematic fashion, and then also present it in a way that's packaged and fun and exciting. We make the competition, we award prizes, which tend to be sort of books and other things um, um, like that. So that's just one aspect of it that I wanted to sort of bring up while we're here, and I want to cede the rest of my time for Tanina, my co-presenter, who's after this, and then you know, follow up with other questions if there are. So yeah, we have additional thoughts that have started to come out as we've been sitting. More questions, ideas? I guess for me, the, the question that occurs in my mind is when we talk about scaling, even if we could scale it, how do we get people to do it? How do we convince people and more people that this is an effective use of their time, and, and even if it's not a billable hour? Anybody have thoughts on that? Are you talking about faculty members or students? Or faculty or in terms of distracting from their teaching, students in terms of distracting from their core curriculum courses, and as Oliver was asking practitioners in terms of distracting from the billable hours that they have and what they can actually charge clients for today rather than what they can charge clients for tomorrow. At the faculty level, um, uh, faculty um, are motivated by um, you know, various kinds of return. Um, um, some of it monetary, some of it prestige, some of it uh, about what the dean uh, is willing to value. Uh, so um, they are they are actually relatively um, um, able to be redirected if if the incentive structure of that is 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 made possible. So one of the cranks is exactly the kind of thing that's being done here, which is to, to make it scholarly, scholarly, then you get what I'm saying, uh, respectable, uh, not respectable but desirable. I mean, what, 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 Create forums for, for discussion around this. Create create publishing opportunities. Create buzz around it. Another is quite frankly get the deans. Uh, you know if you can if you can uh, figure out a way to make the deans value it, 
uh, and it comes down, by the way, you know, and I'd like to, to sprinkle a little incentive around this, then, then that happens. Anyway, I, 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 the, 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 the faculty is probably your easiest if you can get to the right buttons and, and, and push them. Thank you. So the adoption by private practitioners who serve uh, small business and consumers, uh, despite what I said, uh, we have an adaption rate which is increasing in terms of an unbundled legal service model, which is fixed price, and which is accelerated by the use of technology. So if you use things like document automation technologies, your profit margin is now increasing, you can actually bundle legal advice because you cut away some other non-productive processes. What I was talking about before was re-engineering those processes so that they're fruitful, and that your return is actually equivalent to what you'd be making on an hourly basis, but you're using different strategies to do that. That's going to happen. Hopefully, three years. I don't know. It's going to happen. I just don't know when it will mention. Other things that we've done have taken, they've always taken longer to mention the name of thing, you know, like 15 years or whatever. Uh, it, it, will, it will happen because that's where the economy for legal services, consumer legal services, is going. Technology will have to be embedded and enabling. And then we'll have fixed price to get it back to billable hour, except for certain kinds of cases and certain kinds of transactions. And, and, and the other reason it'll happen is because the digital natives will become the majority right. of the population. Right. Right. Most of us in this right. room are, are uh, digital migrants, and uh, right. you know when the digital natives uh, take over, then there's going to be a sea change there. I wanted to return to something Joe had said about students being alarmed that you know where is the, the human skill and the empathy and, and the rest of it. And one thing Conrad and Brian often say is that if you take what can be automated out, you have more time to focus and enhance your skills and do the personal part of lawyering better. And that that is really where we're going if you have enhanced personal skill. Uh, uh, I want quick question. Uh, we've seen this actually in practice, but when automation does, it enables the lawyer to operate at the top of the license. Top of the license means what they're really trained to do. In terms of giving more complex advice and taking uh, things which can be automated, like document assembly, and putting it in that space. So what it actually does is you free up the lawyer to what they really do best, counseling, advocacy, and negotiation. They're not they're really uh, compatible, they're not anybody can make that. Oh, got one more here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no. Is this better? Yeah. Tell us who you are. My name is Terry Clare. I'm with the University of San Diego. And I have an interviewing and counseling class that's a hybrid. We do a lot of simulations and so forth in class. But we also interview real people at a uh, homeless shelter, a senior center, um, various other places. One of the problems that the students have told me is it's hard for them to exercise all these great empathetic behaviors when they're not sure what the law is. And they don't know what questions they really need to ask because this isn't an area they're familiar with. I think that this kind of product can actually assist the ability to have more empathy with the client because you're not completely worried about what you're trying to do in terms of your legal work. Any other thoughts from our uh, panelists before we take our break to come here up on the time? All right, well, thank you, everybody. We're going to come back and do another half hour.